When cleaning your vehicle by valeting, steaming, waxing, or polishing, make sure the engine is also sound. Servicing your vehicle with gold synthetic oil and any quality Goil oil massages the engine, removes deposit, protects it from wear and tear for longer lasting performance, and makes your vehicle feel pampered. Made for diesel and super engines. Remember, after every 15,000 kilometers of enjoying your ride, service your engine with gold synthetic oil. Goil is a champion. That's why I, Azuma Nelson, three times world boxing champion and a patriot, always. Choose Goel. Ashini Pankasa. Goel. Good energy. I can conveniently pay for my utility bills, my son's cartoon network on DSTV, and renew my internet services package. I can securely send my sweet mother her monthly allowance by simply transferring funds from my bond account into hers. I can also pay the gardener through any of the mobile money platforms available. I can verify if the check to the vendor has cleared. Now let me guess my sister is here at time so I can peacefully go back to sleep. With Bond Mobile app, you can do your banking anywhere. Download the Bond Mobile app on Apple Play Store or Google Play Store today. Bond, your success, our passion. There's always that one individual so selfless and caring. The world still has caring people. Getting unexpected help is a joy for us. That's why at Prudential Life, we've introduced Ultimate, the no-lapse guarantee on your premier and classic farewell plans. The biggest challenge for most clients having a funeral policy is the fact that when they are unable to pay premiums due to financial challenges, the policies elapse and the full benefit falls off. We have introduced the no-lapse guarantee on our funeral plans. This ensures that you don't lose your full benefit during challenging financial moments.
The National Science and Math Quiz is the longest running independent production on television. It's the one program that brings education authorities, teachers, allied staff, students, old students associations and parents together in support of science education at the senior high school rank of the education ladder. The objectives of the National Science and Math Squeeze are to promote the study of the sciences and mathematics, to help senior high school students develop quick thinking skills and a probing and scientific mind about things around them, to promote healthy academic rivalry between senior high schools, to a lesser degree, keep old students still interested in their schools and encourage them to offer help to their alma mater to inculcate a degree of science culture in the Ghanaian society for all to see science as a way of life. Let's take a walk down memory lane and see how far we have come in 25 years. The idea was not proposed at a national science fair or conference, but rather on the tennis court of the University of Ghana, Lagos, where Mr. Kweku Mensa Bonsu then managing director of prime time was at the court to play the game after his own heart with his playmate the late professor Ebenezer Kweku Awache professor of animal science Mr Mensa Bonsu was curious as to why birds could stand on a live electric wire without getting electrocuted but human beings could not do so from professor Kweku Awache's explanation Mr. Mensa Bonsu got the idea of a quiz program focused on scientific explanations behind everyday phenomena, in addition to the topics from the regular science curriculum for senior high schools. Thus, it all began 25 years ago, in April 1993. Since then, the National Science and Math Quiz NSMQ has seen 22 exciting additions. Selecting the quiz mistress and the gender was entirely my decision. So one Saturday evening after tennis, we were sitting in Commonwealth Hall, senior common room, and then Marianne was there. So she said, ah. she said, you talk to Marianne. Have you spoken with her? I said, no, I'm going to talk to her. So I talked to Marianne. Then Dr. Marianne Adi, later Professor Marianne Adi. I told her. Gentlemen. I see more gentlemen than ladies, but I still say good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another one of our mentorship sessions for the 2018 National Science and Math Quiz. The mentorship sessions of the 2018 National Science and Math Quiz is sponsored by Bond Savings and Loans and RMG Ghana Limited. The sessions are aimed at Yes, inspiring our students, but more than that, averting their minds to other areas in the sciences they may not have known or thought about. Our mentor for this morning is Dr. Richard Bamfo. He's the CEO and Medical Director of Medifem Multi-Specialist Hospital and Fertility Center. Dr. Bamfo is an expert in obstet obstetrics and gynecology with a high... Okay, so let me start that again. Dr. Bamfol is an expert in obstetrics and gynecology with a high interest in fetal maternal medicine and infertility management. He's the founding medical director and chief executive officer of Medifair Multi Specialist Hospital and Fertility Center. Dr. Bamfol has been practicing has been a practicing gynecologist and obstetrician since 1989 and is nationally and internationally recognized for his extensive work. He has lectured at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, NR Mandela School of Medicine, University of Natal, Durban, the University of Southern Africa, Pretoria, both in South Africa, as well as the University of Ghana Medical School. He's a member of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, London, UK. South African Society of Reproductive Science and Surgery, SARS. 
International Society of Gynecolo Gynecological Endoscopy, <laughs> Southern African HIV Society, Gynecology Management Group, South Africa, and the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. Dr. Banful is an old student of Infant Spring School. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, I'd like you to welcome Dr. Richard Banful. Good morning. My name is Richard Bamfo. 1971-72, I was the dining hall prefect of Kabuki. My job this morning is very simple. To make you interested in becoming doctors. That's my name. I think I'm wearing the same suit now. This is my usual work clothes. These are my alphabets. Maybe I should explain them to you. This makes me a doctor, MBCHB, Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. This is University of Ghana. Then my first PhD, Fellow of the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of South Africa. Then Fellow of the Ghana College of Surgeons, that's another PhD. Fellow of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of London. And because I have these, West Africa donated this to me. <laughs> I work as a consultant obstetrician gynecologist. What it means is I help couples get pregnant. Okay. <laughs> and and when they do, we look after the pregnancy until the baby is born. That's obstetrics. This, this word, obstetrician, obstetrics. And gynecology is diseases of the female genital tract. All diseases concerning the female genital tract. That's where I've been trained in. Um, these words you've been told already. And I'm also the Vice President of the Fertility Society of Ghana. Do you want to be a doctor? Show by hands. Oh, don't disappoint me, please. Many years back, Precisely, I think, 70, yeah, because I wrote my A-levels in um, 72. So, yes, September 72 at A-level class, we wrote behind our notebooks, medical or suicide. But I also wrote behind my exercise book, October 10th, we'll find us there. We enrolled here October 10th, 1972. At this level, you ought to know what you want to do and where you want to go. There are uh, six, six um, about six medical schools in this country, four public, two private. Uh, generally, it takes about six years to become a doctor, to be awarded the first degree. Now, the, the, everybody, I think, does BSc in human biology, and then they pr progress on to do um, the rest of the course. But you need to have the entry requirements, the criteria. I've just been told that WASI is different from the A-levels we did. So you require, apart from your core subjects, you must have elective maths. 
you must have chemistry, physics, biology, or mathematics. Medicine, the core pillars are in chemistry, physics. You'll be surprised. You need biology because everything else is biological. But if you're, if you're a science student and you do mathematics and enter the medical school, you can come out very well. A lot of my classmates came in with uh, mathematics and they survived. And you need elective mathematics because at this level, it's very high-powered science that you do. You need a lot of statistics. In fact, first year, we're all taught statistics here in, the, in this university. But as you go on, at postgraduate level, you must pass a course in statistics. Because when you pick up a scientific paper to read, you must be able to understand the methodology, the observations, and the statistical methods used in analyzing the observations to arrive at the conclusion. The person who prepared this slide for me said I should say that medical school fees are, can be expensive. Um, if somebody's paying your fees, you don't have to worry. All you need to do is to dedicate yourself and study. It can be a very grueling course. I remember when I was in this university, because my first degree is from here, I was in Commonwealth Hall. Yes, I'm, a, I'm an ex-vandal. And at the time when you, you are hard-pressed, you don't even have time to do a lot of things, you go to the junior common room and people are playing drafts there in the morning. You come back from school, they are playing drafts. In the evening, you're passing through, they are playing drafts. So I asked one chap, now, university, are you here? So he's in third year history and they do one lecture a week. And yet, we were so snowed down, so to speak, with work. But you can't survive it. Because as we were told in second year, once you've entered the medical school, your intelligence is assumed. But whether you make it or not, it's just hard work, sitting on your bums to read. A few tips here and there. Yes, pursuing a career is not a joke. You may have to devise new ways to learn for yourself because there's so much information that you require in so little time that I devised a way of learning that I read, read the headlines and then the details will follow. Once I know the headlines, the details will follow. At some stage, we're able to read five lines at a go, you know, because you've got to read. This is important once you are you become a doctor. And as a medical student, you need to be able to have a study group. One of the members of my study group is the, um, the previous vice chancellor of University of uh, UHAS, in who, Prof. Binka, he was in my study group. You may need a mentor, but that's not too important, so long as you are, you are um, committed. Now, specialization, they say, is a new paradigm. What do we mean by that? Once you finish your medical, medical career, not medical career, medical school, and been given your first degree, Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, you do your house job. You become a houseman. That's two years of six months each in, some, in what we call the core disciplines. Medicine, surgery, 
um, obstetrics and gynecology and pediatrics, six months each. And in fact, when you finish medical school, that's when you realize how ignorant you are. Yes, and it can be a very humbling experience. I'll tell you my own experience. Day one, as a house officer, Kolebu, you know, put on my white coat, tie, and <laughs> you'd realize when you go to hospitals, the older doctors don't carry stethoscopes with us, you know, but the young ones put it around their necks. See. Yeah, we're a doctor. And I was on call for medical one. So a call comes through from the polyclinic that um, we need a physician specialist to come. So the house officer goes. I go. And uh, I see this girl who is lying there. She had swallowed 20 tablets of amylobarbitone. It's a drug, um, sleeping tablet. Basically, she wanted to commit suicide. Now, I realized that the lectures on toxicology, uh, I'm not so sure whether I, dubbed it, I dug it or not, but here I was trying to examine the patient until the sister came and said, Doc, call your boss, call your boss. <laughs> oh, sister, oh, call your boss. By the time I was away, she went and called the resident. That's my boss. My boss came and said, Papa, 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 sister, I haven't got word. And I felt so bad. Here I was, doctor, MBCHB, first patient, zero. <laughs> it can be very humbling. We'd like you to specialize. And to specialize, you need to go back to school. You see, you've done your six years. You've done your internship, for two years. That makes eight years. Then you have to write an entrance exam, depending upon what specialty you want to do. If you want to do it in Ghana here, Ghana College, you write an entrance exam. And you go back and read what we call the basic sciences all over again. But this time, with meaning. Because at the, in second year, when you do the basic sciences, you are now learning you know, anatomy, you get a cadaver, you dissect, blah, 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 blah. But a postgraduate, you must know things backwards, so to speak. So then you, go, you enter postgraduate training for another three or four years, depending upon the specialty. Obstetrics and gynecology in South Africa, where I did it was four years. Ghana here is three years. Ours is a straight fellowship, PhD. Ghana here, because you do it as a membership. And it's only when you finish that that you become a junior specialist. That would have taken you about 10 years of studying. And by that time, you should be about age 30, 32. Sometimes 34. And I think it's, it's, it's a good idea that some of us, very senior consultants, believe that we shouldn't, you shouldn't be made a junior consultant until after age 30, no matter how bright you are. Because when you are managing patients, you use life's experiences in managing patients. You don't just go by the book. You know the book, you digest it, and you translate it into your culture, your environment, your happenings to be able to render good and appropriate service to your clients. And if you don't specialize, then you become what they call a GP, general practitioner. And you may never climb up the ladder. So the advice is finish your first degree, choose what you want to be, 
and go back to school and polish yourself up. Medical practice gives you opportunity to save lives. And this is very true. And certainly in my field, when for one reason or the other, you are not able to save the mother, it hits you like a bolt. It's also an opportunity to offer hope. Hope to your patients. Hope to your couples. Hope to your grandfathers and mothers. And it may be an opportunity to reform society through advice and insights. But the advice the politicians don't take it, you see. Um, if you want to be a bit philosophical, you start saying, why am I on earth? Perhaps that's why I'm here. And it will certainly involve some amount of personal sacrifice. It certainly does. I get asked, I've got a son and a daughter, and I get asked, I know if your children doctors said no. Why? So no. My son, when he was a lot younger, now he's a big man, when he was a lot younger, he would say, I would ask him, but Kevin, why don't you want to become a doctor? He said, Daddy, you are never at home. When you come home and we are eating, the phone rings and you get up and go. When I ask you for money, so you don't have any money. Why should I become a doctor? For me, it is a calling. It is not just a job. We have this saying in medicine that as a doctor, I don't close from work. I finish my work. And part of um, a modification of the Hippocratic Oath, which we doctors take, is that you continue working until your patient relieves you or your legs relieve you. Do, do, do you get me? You continue working until either your patient gets better or kicks the bucket or you collapse while we're looking after the patient. So you work until your work is finished. And that's why I say it has to be a calling, because if it's not, um, you won't enjoy your career. It is not an opportunity to make quick money. Yes, you can lead a very comfortable and rewarding life. I mean, look at my tummy. It is not an opportunity to take advantage of people because you come into very close contact with people. You get to know their story and they give you their story in trust and you cannot let them down. It is not an opportunity to engage in illegality or criminality and certainly it doesn't belong to anybody. It's not the preserve of any gender, race, tribe, or privileged few. I was told not to say this, but I will still say it. We use this word medical suicide because you want to focus. This is what you want to do. At age nine, there was a science fair at Cultural Center in Kumasi where I, 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 I grew up. And one of the things that fascinated me was having um, the biology students, you probably would have done this experiment, of having a pissed frog. You know the frog that you piss at the back of the head? Then you put on a camograph, and the camograph is moving. So maybe it's, it's all computerized now, so you don't know it. 
but the frog is alive and it's connected to this camograph and it's moving. So at age nine, I go there and I see, and I was fascinated. So I go back home, and I go back and speak to the people who were organizing it. They told me. So when I, the next time I went home, the nearest frog I caught and put under a tin to finish my work and repeat the experiment, this time on my own at home. When I came back, a cousin of mine, and may he rest in peace, he's no longer with us, he had let the frog go away. You should come and see the war that was in the house. Because I wanted to be a doctor. There are countless opportunities in the health sciences. Medicine is just one of them. And for me, that's what I wanted to do, and that's what I'll encourage a lot of us to do. Ghana needs a lot of doctors. Our doctor patient population ratio is not good. And a good many of us get trained here and we fly out and never come back. Please, if you've got the calling, if you've got the aptitude, sign up and enter a medical school. You will not regret it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Banfo. Now I'll take questions from the audience. So if you have any question, just raise your hand. A mic will be brought to you, and you can ask your question. There's a question on this side. Thank you very much. Please, I'll, I have two questions. Okay, so please, my first question is, um, if you have a Jehovah Witness patient coming to your hospital and the person needs blood, seriously needs blood, but because of their beliefs, they can't take blood, what do you do in such a situation? Thank you. Is there two questions? And, okay, my second question is, deep down within you, why did you want to be a doctor? Why did you want to do medicine? Why? I'll answer your second one first. I'll always say, maybe in my next life, I might be foolish enough to want to be a doctor again. I don't know whether that may answer your question. Um, at A levels, I got an A in physics. All right? B in biology and A in chemistry. I could have gone on to be a nuclear scientist, but I wanted to be a doctor. So I don't know how to explain, express it to you. That's why behind my exercise book, I had written medical or suicide. Thankfully, I didn't commit suicide. Your first question about the Jehovah's Witness, this is ethical, ethical question. What would I do if a Jehovah's Witness person is dying? Sorry, requires blood. The Jehovah's Witness person would have signed that no matter what happens, do not give me blood. It is very difficult to see a life ebbing away because of that belief. I've learned my lesson, madam. Let me tell you a story about this. I practiced in South Africa for 24 years before I came back. There was a patient of mine who was a Jehovah's Witness lady. She was pregnant with her eighth child. Didn't come to hospital in good time. She came in at a time when 
her womb had burst. Ruptured uterus. It's a life-threatening condition. If we don't enter quickly, you are gone. In fact, with ruptured uterus, once the womb bursts, the baby is gone. And you, it's you the mother that, whose life we are battling to save. And we need blood. We wheeled this patient into theatre. Big anesthetist, me, other people, very quickly operating to stop the bleeding and remove the womb and all that. But before she could be put to sleep, the nurses asked her quietly, we know you are your witness. You don't want blood. If you don't give you blood, you will die. It was recorded. The woman said, give me the blood. All right? So we went ahead and secretly gave her blood two units on the table, other should have died on the theater table, really. And we swore each other to secrecy, because this is the woman, the woman wanted it. A few days later, the husband comes to me and asks me, did you give the patient blood? And I said, yes, we did. Why did you give her blood? I said, well, on, the, on her deathbed, so to speak, she said we should give her the blood. So we gave her the blood. This woman was divorced by her husband. Your witness, they marry each other. They don't go out of the church. The, woman, the man divorced her after the eighth child, but that child had died. So seven children got divorced. This woman was working in a shop owned by a Jehovah's Witness person. She was fired because she was no longer clean. And to cap it all, two months after delivery, this woman hanged herself. It's a story I have never forgotten. And I've been asking myself, did I do her any good? If I didn't give her the blood, she would have died on the theater table. I gave her blood and she died two months later. Did I do right? I'm asking you as a question, did I do right? These are things that will forever etch on my mind. We have another question down here somewhere. Yes, please bring the mic to the front here. Sorry, I can't hear. Thank you very much, Doc. I like the passion with which you did your presentation. When I was also coming up as a young boy in secondary school, my passion was to also become a medical doctor. I have abandoned that passion. It's not too late. <laughs> But I'm also proud that if I had been a doctor, I would have been one doctor. But I'm now producing doctors because I'm a teacher. Good. I am teaching a lot of doctors, and I'm Good. proud of that. Good. I would like to find out from you. Something has been baffling my mind. Doctors save life. But... Some doctors also destroy life by causing abortion. What are some of the reasons why a doctor would like to cause an abortion? Again, it's an ethical question. My simple answer. Huh? is doctors save lives. Doctors who terminate pregnancy will do so in the hope that they will save the life of the mother.
that's where I'll stop. Because in my, in my field, in my field, I have terminated pregnancies. Sorry? Somebody asked how many? Oh, more than you can, you can care to, to tell. I've been a consultant gynecologist since 1989. Before a lot of people in this room were born. All right? I'll ignore that word killing. I have sworn an oath to save lives. Let's not bring in the religious and all that of uh, um, termination of pregnancy. In fact, as I speak in my hospital, there's a patient who I advised to have termination of pregnancy because the condition she has, the mother, if the pregnancy goes on, she has a 70% chance of dying in pregnancy. 70% chance. She's got primary pulmonary hypertension, if you will understand it. And patients with primary pulmonary hypertension, the maternal mortality is about 70%. Seven out of 10 who have that don't make it in pregnancy. She's got two children already before she developed that condition. Why would I lead her on to die and leave the other two children? You see what I mean? We are not abortionists, but we are allowed to give advice when it concerns the mother and the unborn baby. Thank you. Yes, we have another question. Um, for some reason, the students are not asking questions. It's the teachers asking questions, maybe for the students. Thank you, Dr. Gynecologist dealing with the female reproductive tract and these diseases. The men, what is ours? And you do something about it. And the term. We look after men when it concerns fertility. All right? But doctors who look after the reproductive tract of men, not just reproductive tract, doctors who look after the, okay, the urogenital tract of men are called urologists. Again, it's a four or six year post first degree to do it. Those are the doctors who um, handle the prostate gland and its problems, the kidney and its problems, all the tracts, okay, and how they affect various diseases and various diseases affected. They are urologists. They are urological surgeons. Like me, I'm a gynecological surgeon. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Bounfold. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Okay. The, 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 the lady. The, okay. That lady there. Yeah? Yeah, that lady there. Yeah, yes. yeah you. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. So please, I'll also like to know, I would also like you to please give um, a word of advice to anyone that wants to do medicine, like, um, in the university as to how they should go about their interview and how they should write their exam and what they should keep in mind as they go through the six years in medical school. Thank you. Sorry, you, 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 you want to know how they should go about which interview? The interview, like, after the results come out, they write an exam and they also go for an interview. So I would like you to please give them some words of advice. Thank you. No, when you go to the interview, be yourself. I, I went for an interview and um, there were six, six panelists. I think it was, it was held Great Hall or somewhere like that. 
I was 19 then, and um, my late professor of surgery, who was on the panel, Professor Beidu, asked, why do you want to become a doctor? And I said, sir, because I, I like the subject. He said, rubbish, you don't have a doctor, how can you like the subject? This was at the interview. So I was ruffled. But I was still chosen. Be yourself. Don't attempt to impress anybody. You know? It's so interesting when you see the interview, you ask a question. You see, the person is struggling to use English words that he doesn't understand, your experiences. We are, we are like your teachers, we are seasoned people. You open your mouth and I can tell you, be yourself but have a passion for the work you're going to do. All right? In medical school, study, study, study. And for you as a woman, don't eat me up for what I'm going to say. But if you want to have a family after medical school, hook yourself up with somebody in medical school first. It doesn't have to be a doctor, all right? Because you spend all your time studying, and by the time you come out, all the nice boys are gone. <laughs> yeah. Any more? Another round of applause for Dr. Bamfo, ladies and gentlemen. Can you finish? Yes. Okay. Can I say the last Yes, one? please. We'll give you the final words, Doc. My final words are... We want you to come and join us in medicine and Kwabotwe, you are on. Ladies and gentlemen, please, another round of applause for Dr. Richard Brown. The mentorship sessions of the 2018 National Science and Maths Quiz is brought to you by Bond Savings and Loans and RMG Ghana Limited. We have given you some evaluation forms to fill for us. What we'd like to know is whether these sessions are important to you, whether they are impactful, how well we are doing as um, uh, in terms of the mentorship sessions. So please, when you are done filling your form, just raise it up. Production assistants will come and pick them up. Thank you very much. See you again tomorrow morning. Thank you. I can conveniently pay for my utility bills, my son's cartoon network on DSTV, and renew my internet services package. I can securely send my sweet mother her monthly allowance by simply transferring funds from my bond account into hers. I can also pay the gardener through any of the mobile money platforms available. I can verify if the check to the vendor has cleared. Now let me guess my sister is here at time so I can peacefully go back to sleep. With Bond Mobile app, you can do your banking anywhere. Download the Bond Mobile app on Apple Play Store or Google Play Store today. Bond, your success, our passion.